And now, the continued story of the 1986 Giants. If there was a turning point for the 1986 Giants, it came in the final moment. That is my favorite game of all. I, I enjoyed that game more than I did the Super Bowl. My first game as a, as a pro was great. But the Minnesota game up there, it's the highlight of my career. Fourth and 17, Sam's drops back to the 40. Sam's throws. Completed, he's in. Yes, at the 30-yard line. Touchdown. Sam's spot, the kick, the drop it is good. Over the next few weeks, there was no better NFL quarterback. Sims engineered a 21-point comeback in San Francisco before leading the Giants to a division-clinching victory in Washington. He tossed four touchdown passes in a division playoff, a blowout over the 49ers that set the stage for a blustery NFC championship. prepared for a trip to a warmer climate. And the Giants will be checking their reservation from Pasadena. As we're getting ready for the Super Bowl, Bill Parcells comes out of his office and he's got a big chart of the Rose Bowl. He's got a tripod. He puts the chart up on the tripod and he looks at me and he said, look, these are the sections that our fans will be in. When you come running out of that tunnel, here's where they'll be. Take that towel, get them revved up, because we want to make it seem like it's Giants Stadium. Got the ball. Backs up to the two. He's in the end zone. He got him. He takes that off. Sam's trying to throw down. Touchdown! In a fitting end to a glorious season, the Giants crushed the Denver Broncos with Phil Simms' flawless performance earning him the game's MVP award. When Simms' third and final touchdown pass dropped into the hands of Phil McConkie, Giant fans knew that after 30 years, their day of deliverance had arrived. The Giants have accomplished something that many people thought they would never see. When we won, it wasn't just for the guys on the field, but it was for all of those fans who wanted to cry when Larry Zonk and Joe Pisarczyk fumbled the ball and Herm Ed Edwards ran the ball in. The victory was for Wellington Mara, who wanted to win just as much or more than anybody else. The greatest thing that ever happened when we won that championship was to see him embrace that Vince Lombardi trophy because God knows there has never been another owner in the NFL that deserved more. It's not so much Andy Robustelli and Y.A. Tittle and Frank Gifford anymore. In the good old days are Phil Simms and Lawrence Taylor and Mark Bavaro and Joe Morris. I guess in a way we're the ghosts of this current team. I think uh, Dave Brown said it best one day. He goes, I am really sick of hearing about you. <laughs> I said, yeah, Dave, they forgot those 180 interceptions I threw. They just remember a couple of championships and, and the touchdowns. I won the throw. One more pass in my giant jersey. Looking back, I realized what a situation I put him in. <laughs> National TV. I know, think of all the pressure, because I was thinking about he throw. What happens if you don't throw right or he drops it? I mean, that's uh, I'll remember. Say, yeah, I feel the last I know, pass. I know. He overthrew Lawrence Taylor. I never thought of that. Here we go.
When sports cream, when legs are sore, when backs ache, when muscles hurt, why sports cream? Rubbing it in brings fast pain relief. No medicine is smell. Why sports cream? Because it works. Want to go to the Super Bowl with ESPN? Play ESPN's Punt Pass and Win, presented by Visa, the official card of the NFL. Watch Sunday Night NFL on ESPN, and you could win a trip to the Super Bowl in San Diego. See, that is a picture of the Depression. And yet, what I've done is colorize that picture, and it's not as depressing. Voila. Depressing? Not depressing. You can almost imagine the look on their faces. They're a little happier. Pop's got a red plaid shirt and a blue... We're back with the NFL's big tuna, Bill Parcells. Before I became the head coach of the Giants, I coached the linebackers. And some of the things that I tried to stress was stress with. Oh, God. Some of the things that I tried to stress. St Golly. I always emphasize that. Oh, I got to start this over. Okay. The Giants matured and grew through learning from a very, very difficult set of circumstances that, that existed in the 82 season. The 82 season. I can't get this right. That was really good, though. I mean, it was, we were on a roll. Yeah, it was coming on pretty good. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Just take your time, regroup, and we're still rolling. Yeah. You're actually getting better. Yeah, I think you are. And it seems to you want to trade? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can do that right there, too. <laughs> he, if he wants to do that. I think I can do that. Well, we'll take a turn. I'll stay here. I'll stay here. Uh, Ready to go? I'm going to get it right this time. Actually, nothing went right for Bill Parcells in his first year as a head coach. The pain of 12 defeats was also compounded by off-the-field suffering. People just don't realize the personal traumas that he went through that year. He, he lost his offensive coordinator, who died suddenly during training camp. Parcells lost his mother and father within six weeks of each other, all during the season, and yet endured all that, and I think that was a great crucible for him. I'll never forget in 83 in the offseason, he came to me and says, you know, Sims, I almost got fired this year, but this coming year, we're going to do things my way, and it, that way, if I do get fired, at least I knew I did it my way. Parcells made Phil Sims his starting quarterback built a defense around Lawrence Taylor and recruited players that could scare opponents and himself. I tell you, he's a stone face, that Cabrero now. You know what the hell he's thinking. I'd hate to have to fight that son of a gun. By 1986, the Giants had also learned to be mentally tough. I think Bill Parcells had a calendar up in his office, and he said, you know what, on this day, next Tuesday, I'm going to be a real you-know-what. Everybody could be executing their plays flawlessly, but Parcells would find something to bitch about, and he would find one or two guys to pick on that day to use as an example. Some days he'd come out to practice and go, hey, I'm really proud of you, you're doing well, but I want you to know today I'm just going to chew your butt out on that field. <laughs> and I go, why? He goes, because I want them other people to know that I can get on my quarterback, and that means I can get on them if something goes wrong. Hey, Phil, I won the game! But the players also got on the coach. Well, somebody give me something. Okay. Right. I ain't got time to make the call. Whenever you challenge the authority, the sovereignty of a, of a head coach, you become expendable all of a sudden. But with Bill, it was almost coming of age. Terry Kennard was playing, I think, free safety at the time, and he misread a, a read or whatever it was, and they made a big play on us. Hey! And, and Parcells said to Terry, what the Blake were you doing? And <laughs> Terry said, what do you mean what the Blake I was doing? I was doing my effing job. What the, you think I was doing? And I was like, holy gee, but they actually cursed the coach here. <laughs> you would go out and do things to other people on an opposite team because you're so mad at him, which is what he wanted us to do all the time. He loved it. Methods of motivation. 
There was nothing complicated about Parcells' game plans. We only had a few plays. Every single team in the, that we played knew what we were going to run. And it didn't make any difference. This team imposed its will on everybody else. Well, the medal it is. Complete to Bavaro down to the 35. Still on his feet to the 30. Down to the 25. Down to the 20. He's got four men on his back. Take it down to the 17. By November of 1986, the Giants began to look like a team of destiny. The 1986 Giants were also the first NFL team to shower their coach with Gatorade, something they did 17 times that season. Initially, it wasn't anything but an impulsive thought that one of them had, just have a little fun with Bill. Knowing Bill Parcells was so superstitious, if you did something one week and it worked, you had to continue to do it. The thing about it was that it, it always surprised me. It was a fun deal. It was a symbol of our affection for our coach. He was one of us. Uh, he went through the down times also. And uh, I look at it like this. It's better for him to get a Gatorade shower than for us to walk off the field after a loss. Yeah, you are. Playing in the NFL means everything to me. No way I'm playing a video game without the NFL. I want the game that plays like NFL football. I want a game that has all the NFL teams. I want the game that gets me to the Super Bowl. Again! NFL Quarterback Club 98. The only officially licensed NFL game on N64. I think we have ourselves a new dynasty here. Acclaimed sports. Sweat the details. I hate machines! Huh. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Rosie. Why don't we go to the new Sprint store at Radio Shack, George? They have Sprint's easy-to-use products. And the know-how of Radio Shack. They even showed Astro how to use his mobile phone. They could even help you, Mr. J. Astro has a mobile phone? Hello, Rhonda. The new Sprint store at Radio Shack. You've got questions, we've got answers. cold, windy December afternoon in 1956, the New York Giants trotted out to take on the Chicago Bears for the NFL championship. The Giant offense was run by a hard-boiled assistant coach named Vince Lombardi. Lombardi was working on a new design he called the Power Sweep. For in his opinion, the way to win was to run to daylight. The defense was coordinated by a bright young civil engineer named Tom Landry, whose innovative new 4-3 alignment spelled doomsday for the Bears. As America looked on, the Giants steamrolled Chicago 47-7. And those in the know suspected that head coach Jim Lee Howell's club had many more championships in its future. I didn't really know what a dynasty meant back in my rookie year. Uh, but I, you know, I knew we had a, a nucleus of some good ball players on our team. And all of a sudden, in the media capital of the world, and that's what New York was and still is, there was this tremendous focus on individuals. Uh, we were on the game shows, Price is Right, What's My Line, and all of a sudden, pro football was just uh, thrown at the people uh, around the entire nation. The unfortunate part about it, it's the last one we ever won. I don't think individually we had that fantastic a group of athletes. I think what we did have was the ability to play together, to take a concept, and to work within that concept, and to develop that concept, and to make the concept work. Tom Landry's defenses neutralized Cleveland great Jim Brown through most of Brown's career, except in 1957, when the rookie led his team to a sweep of the Giants and a berth in the championship game. But one year later, 
the biggest television sports audience of that era tuned in to watch the Giants battle back from a 14-3 deficit and take a three-point lead over Baltimore in the final period. Then, on third and short, they sent Frank Gifford off right tackle, needing only a first down to win the world title. It was a clear first down that Gifford had. The official walks up, picks up the ball, moves it back a yard, then calls a change into measure, and we were about a foot short. We were on the wrong end of the call, but that gave us no excuse for allowing Baltimore to take the ball, and then they drove down and scored on us. They tied it up, and we had to go into overtime. Shortly after this defeat, Vince Lombardi left New York to become head coach in Green Bay. One year later, the Colts again beat the Giants in the title game. This time, it was Tom Landry's turn to move on, taking a head coaching job with an expansion team in Dallas called the Cowboys. They miss your leaders. Lombardi left, uh, Landry left. These men you don't easily replace. In 1961, the Giants tried to lure Lombardi back to New York as head coach. Ultimately, Allie Sherman got the job. Sherman brought in veteran quarterback Y.A. Tittle to get the team back to the title game. Ironically, that game took place in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We landed an airplane, it was 10 degrees below zero, and we had about 5,000 people of the Packers out at the airport to boo us when we got off the plane. Now you know you're in the wrong city, right from the beginning. Not surprisingly, the frost-bitten Giants were never in the game. One year later, the same two teams met in Yankee Stadium, and once again, gale force winds and frigid Arctic air conspired with the Packer defense to shut down the pass-minded Giants. When you look back at it, coming into the game, I think all those championship games, we're, we were a little older team, and uh, I think that had a little bit of an effect on us for a particular game. Take, for example, the 1963 NFL Championship, where Y.A. Tittle played with a severe knee sprain and was brutalized by the bear pass rush. I went to Y.A. and I said, look, you got us three points. We're leading 10 to 7. That's all we need. The Bears can't beat us. Stay out. We'll win the championship for you. They taped him up, put him in the game, hurt. He turned the ball over again on screen passes, and we lost the game 14 to 10. For the New York Giants, the breaks of the game again went against them. The 63 championship game, I think, was my biggest disappointment because in my personal opinion, and I know that a lot of Chicago Bears may be listening to me say this, but I felt we had the best team that year. We represented the Giants, we took our shots, and we lost, but at least we were there at the end, losing, but we, we were there. It just seemed like the, in those championship games, we seemed maybe to choke, or either to choke or not, uh, come up with the big plays, and that's what you have to have in pro football. We were in six world championship games. Had we won none of them, is it so disgraceful to be second best out of the whole lot for so many years when so many teams never even made it? It wasn't embarrassing to lose them. Well, you sure didn't want to lose them because you, you thought, that again, you'd never maybe get that opportunity again, but we were a dynasty. Steve Sable. One of the greatest values of sports is that they provide us with people worthy of our admiration. People who work hard, who believe in themselves, and who are committed to doing their best. Men like Rocky Blyer, after being wounded in Vietnam. The passing game intact or a derivative of such. And Don would always be yelling, throw it, throw it. I mean, it'd be third down and inches. The Giants. First place on the line, John Riggins won't be here, O.J. Anderson won't be here, but there'll be some power running football tonight. We'll see you at the top of the hour.
No question about that, Jaws. Terry Allen, Charles, get out of my way for the Giants. Big game atop the NFC East. That's coming up at the top of the hour right after NFL prime time. Plenty to show you here on week 13. The Ravens, their youngster, do I say it to Peter Puglia. That's Jake Plummer. Could he keep it going? And the big game of the day, Cowboys and the Packers. So, he really plays in them? Yeah. Mark Brunel and the Nike Air Marauders. Almost took them all the way last year. A scrambler like him needs some real tracks to make the plays he does. Terry Collins has the same shoes too, right? You bet. He took them right past San Fran and through Cowboy Country. <laughs> Nobody gets you closer to the game than Foot Locker, where it all begins. Hey, when it comes to the weekend, we figure it's time for kicking back. Yeah, right. Everything to me. No way I'm playing a video game without the NFL. I want the game that plays like NFL football. I want a game that has all the NFL teams. I want the game that gets me to the Super Bowl. Again! NFL Quarterback Club 98. The only officially licensed NFL game on N64. I think we have ourselves a new dynasty here. Acclaimed sports. Sweat the details. NFL Pass Tag is brought to you by 1-800-COLLECT. The way we call Collect today. Now, welcome back to NFL Primetime. Arizona at Baltimore. Well, Jake Plummer, a little excitement certainly for Arizona, although this is their third straight game on the road, and they've lost eight straight games on the road anywhere. But to kind of plagiarize Edgar Allan Poe a little bit, the big question in Baltimore, quote the Ravens' offense, never more. I mean, what, what, what's happened here? Vince Tobin looking for a road win. I love this. Stu, you must have done the first three quarters. Run the first quarter. <laughs> Jake Plummer. You have good highlights, though. So. Scrambles 19 yards to the first down. Arizona trailing 10-6. Fourth and goal at the four. Touchdown. We love Plummer. He flushes it to Frank Sanders. Arizona leads it 13-10. Later on, 2.25 to go. Down by three. Vinny Testaverde to Ryan Yarborough. Yarborough drives up to the 34-yard line. Next play. Bam Morris smokes his way for 18 more yards down to the 16. That sets up a matched over field goal. We're tied at 13. Then Jake Plummer, Rob Moore, and a smart play getting out of bounds at the 31 with seven seconds to go. Yeah, and a pass here to Anthony Edwards, which gets him another five yards closer for a field goal. Call the timeout. They hold the hands. It worked for Dallas holding hands last week. Joe Nesney has three field goals. It's good. Arizona's one on the road. Jake Plummer. And for a while, he didn't look good, but we didn't show you that. We showed you when he looked good because we liked him. Cardinals beat the Ravens by the count of 16-13. And, uh, you know, Tommy, Plummer showing a little aplomb. Well, the last-minute heroics, we knew that they were there. And the questions with the Ravens, you mentioned earlier, fourth consecutive game where this team has held under 16 points. What's going on to the offense? Well, they're 4-7-1 on Arizona, 3-9. When we return at NFL prime time, you've seen this all year, but you can't see it enough. Unfortunately, the Colts saw too much. Barry Sanders hit a 